Good morning. Would you uh, pray with me? Heavenly Father, we, um, we're just so thankful um, as we took this last week to just kind of reflect on all the ways that you've blessed us individually, as families, as a church. Um, we just are just so uh, humbled by your um, just lavish and um, incredible uh, mercies and blessings to us. Uh, be with us today. I just ask that um, the message that you would like to get across to these people is yours and not mine. I just ask that you will uh, just prepare our hearts and our minds to be fertile soil for your word, and uh, just be with us as we continue this service. We love you, Father, and let me pray. Amen. So I hope everybody had a, a wonderful and restful and plentiful Thanksgiving. I know that, uh, you know, we talked about at the um, our Thanksgiving Eve service, you know, Jeremy pointed out that there are far more statutes on how to feast properly than there are about how to fast. So I hope you guys all took that advice and feasted um, like you should. Um, today, I'd like to spend some time uh, in Exodus. Um, and what's interesting about that is it just so happens that over the last few months, I've been spending some time going back through uh, the scripture kind of from a different perspective. Um, a friend of mine had referred me to an amazing podcast um, that's run by this a um, Messianic Jew, he studied under a rabbi, and he's really kind of going through the scripture as a Eastern, as a ancient Hebrew would have approached the scripture. It's been very eye-opening. And it just so happens that at the same time, Jeremy and Christy got to go to the Holy Land. Ever heard of it? And, um, and so I've been super excited to hear what they saw and experienced, and they've been so great to share pictures with us over the last couple services. And it's been really exciting, and I, it, it's perfect that this ties into that because we are talking about what they were sharing with and what Romans has been talking about, talking about Abraham and the covenant. So I was super excited that this just so happened to be what I wanted to share today. And so um, this morning I want to talk about um, a point in time in uh, Israel's history that God um, tested his people uh, through their time of wandering in the wilderness. There were a few tests that God brought to his people um, over that 40 years that they spent uh, in the wilderness. And um, each one of these tests focused on a different aspect of trusting God. Um, Deuteronomy 6.5, if you want to put that up, Dave. Uh, Deuteronomy 6.5 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. So these are three different aspects, the heart, soul, and might. And so this test that we're looking at today involves the heart. You know, we're told that God wanted to know his people. And God wanted his people to know him. And the word that would have been used there is a word we may have heard recently, a word called yada. And yada was to know, but not just a head knowledge. It was an experiential knowledge. It was more intimate than that. And so God wanted to yada his people and vice versa. But again, this was an experiential knowledge. And, and yada, the term, is such an intimate term that it actually has a sexual overtone to it, where in the scripture it says, Adam yada Eve, and they conceived and had a child. So you can see that this is a deep experiential knowledge, not just a casual head knowledge. God wanted to experience what was in their hearts. So as we go, um, I'm going to share this. So in the 1960s, um, a Stanford professor named Walter Michel began conducting a series of important psychological studies. And during the experiments, uh, Michel and his team, they tested hundreds of children around the ages of four or five. And this revealed what is now believed to be one of the most important characteristics for health, work, and life. The experiment began by bringing each child into a private room, sitting them down in a chair, and placing a marshmallow on the table in front of them. And at this point, the researcher would offer a deal to the child. The researcher would tell the child, okay, I'm going to leave the room, okay, and if you don't eat the marshmallow, when I come back, I'll give you a second marshmallow. That was the deal. And so the researcher would leave the room for 15 minutes. And now you can imagine that the footage of these kids sitting in the chairs in front of this marshmallow was probably very entertaining. You know, some kids would just jump up and eat it right away. Other kids would squirm in their chair and try to not eat it and then eventually eat it. And a couple of them actually did not eat that first marshmallow. And so... This study, uh, published in 1972, became known as the Marshmallow Experiment. It goes without saying. But it wasn't the treat that made it famous. The interesting part came years later. Um, as the years rolled on, these researchers tracked the children from the experiment. And what they saw was that over the years, 
the children who are willing to delay the gratification of grabbing that marshmallow, they actually ended up having, on average, higher SAT scores, lower levels of, su of substance abuse, lower likelihood of obesity, better response to stress, they had better social skills, as reported by their parents, and generally, just better scores in a range of other measures. These researchers followed these kids for more than 40 years, and, and again and again, the ones who waited patiently for that second marshmallow ended up succeeding in whatever capacity they were measuring. So in other words, the series of experiments that were done, um, they proved that the ability to delay gratification was critical for success in life. If you look around, you can see this playing out in a lot of different ways, right? So if you delay the gratification of watching TV when you get home from school and do your homework, well, you'll get better grades, you'll learn more. If you delay the gratification of buying desserts and junk food at the grocery store, then you'll eat healthier when you get home. Uh, if you delay the gratification of finishing your workout early and you put in that extra few reps, you'll be stronger. And so, off, so forth and so on. Now, I'm not saying that w just waiting on things will make you smarter or stronger, but what I am saying is that um, the outcomes from the study are very interesting and that there's value in not acting impulsively. This is my background music. Just enjoy it. In, in Exodus chapter 15, uh, we read about the nation of Israel during their time of wandering in the desert. Um, just to catch you up, God spoke to Moses, told him to free the people out of Pharaoh's hand. Um, Pharaoh said no. God sent the ten plagues. Plague 10 was the death of the firstborn of any household that did not spread the blood over the doorposts. Pharaoh says, okay, you can get out of here. Then he changes his mind, decides to chase them down and destroy them. Uh, but then God parts the Red Sea. The people walk through. God destroys the armies of Pharaoh and the water recedes. Now we're all caught up, okay? So Exodus 15, 22 to 27 is my passage. But I'd like to start back at verse 19. So if you want to open up your Bibles... or your Bible apps, or actually, if you want to open the Restore app, we have a link to the Bible in there as well. And I hope you all have the Restore app, because it's a really great app, and there's a lot of great features. So if you don't have it, I'll give you a few minutes later on, and you can go to the App Store or Google Play Store, and you can download that app. Anyway, Exodus 15, and I'm going to start at verse 19, and I think it'll be on the screens as well. For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Now here's verse 22. Here's where my passage starts. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. Good idea? Sure. They went three days in the wilderness, and they found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet, became fit to drink. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them. He said, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. So Tradition holds that the journey from the Red Sea to Sinai was 40 days. And over this 40-day period is where we see these three various tests. Um, Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 4 says, The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know or yada, what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread or sustenance alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Now, with tests, you know, when we as Westerners think of tests, we think pass-fail, we think grades in school, but to the Eastern audience, 
uh, tests are opportunities, okay? And this test is a two-way opportunity. The people get to show God their willingness to obey, and God gets to show the people his ability to give them exactly what they need when they need it. This first test is to see what's in their heart. To a Jewish reader, the heart is the will. When we talk about worship coming from the heart, that's the submission of our will and obedience to God. So here, it's three days after they've crossed through the Red Sea, okay? Three days, and they were thirsty. You know, try walking through the dry desert for three days with nothing to drink, and you tell me how you feel. So Moses knew his way around the desert. Um, you'll remember that he actually spent 40 years in the desert uh, tending his father-in-law's herds, okay? Now, the Israelites, this whole business about knowing God. If you'll remember, the Israelites just spent the last 430 years in Egypt, and what little they still knew of God was, was kind of a distant memory. There was oral tradition, there was still some, something there, but nothing like what they should have known. As a matter of fact, Scripture tells us that um, they started to kind of mirror or mimic the religions around them. They started to kind of adapt and, you know, take on some of that. And, you know, if you think about it, what would you remember from 430 years ago? I mean, not a lot. It's just kind of what you're told. It's all just urban legends and oral tradition. Now, God needed to reacquaint himself with his people, obviously. You know, he wanted to know them and he wanted them to know him. You know, because, you know, like the, the old saying goes, you can take the people out of Egypt, but you can't take Egypt out of the people. And God needed to take Egypt out of the people. So if you remember the, the marshmallow experiment that we just talked about, um, researchers at the University of Rochester, they decided to replicate that same experiment, but with a twist, okay? Before offering the children the marshmallows, the researchers split the kids into two groups. The first group, they were exposed to a series of unreliable experiences. Um, where the researcher would say, okay, uh, here's a small box of crayons. I'm going to leave, and I'm going to bring you a larger box of crayons when I come back. He'd come back without the larger crayons. He'd say, here's a small sticker book. When I come back, I'll give you a larger selection of bigger stickers. He'd come back, no more stickers, okay? Very unreliable experiences. Meanwhile, the second group, um, they had very reliable experiences. They were promised the better crayons, and they got the better crayons. They were promised the better stickers, and they got the better stickers. That was their experience. The children in the unreliable group had no reason whatsoever to trust the researchers by bringing them a second marshmallow because they didn't have that experience with the other things they promised. Meanwhile, the children in the second group, they were training their brains to see that that delayed gratification of waiting on the marshmallows was a positive thing. Every time the researcher made a promise, they delivered on it. So the child's brain is registering two things. The first thing is that delaying gratification and waiting is worth it. And secondly, I have the ability to do that, to wait and delay that gratification. So in other words, the child's ability in this experiment to delay gratification itself was not predetermined, but it was impacted by the experiences and the environment that surrounded them. In fact, the effects of the environment were almost instantaneous. Just a few minutes of that reliable or unreliable experience were enough to push the actions of each child one direction or the other. You know, as I was reading um, this text and I was thinking about these marshmallow experiments, all I kept thinking was that the people just experienced some pretty incredible stuff, right? I mean, it's just, just witnessing those plagues. Obviously, they didn't get affected by them, but they could see all this happening. These plagues are sent. just. Three days ago, they walked through the Red Sea. Like, that's not an everyday occurrence, guys. Like, this is pretty incredible stuff. Yet, when they didn't have water and a need popped up, they're like, oh, what are we going to drink? Like, they start grumbling. It just seemed strange to me. Yet, they had this experience, but it didn't seem to register the same way it did for the kids in the marshmallow experiment. You know, so the Hebrew people... They've been living in Egypt for the last four generations, and all the data that they've collected thus far were that gods are temperamental, and that, you know, as, as a matter of fact, by the time of the Exodus, when they left Egypt, the Israelites were demanding of Moses, like, what is this guy's name? Who is this God? Who is Yahweh? And so they felt like this Yahweh must have been subordinate to the Egyptian deities because of the fact that they've been enslaved for all this time. Clearly, he's not that strong. He's just like any of the other gods. So all this information was the data that they were collecting. So I suppose even as big as the Red Sea was, it was, you know, 
one thing in the last maybe couple months versus 400 years of just assuming that there is no God and hearing their cry. He's just one of many gods. So there's a lot of information that has to be corrected here. And so God had to demonstrate power over Egypt's gods, especially the Nile and Pharaoh himself, and he had to go to extremes to basically obliterate what their thought and their vision was on what um, divinity was and, and what that meant. So, so the people here, the Israelites, if you think about it, they're more like the children in the first experiment. They, these children were not accustomed to um, this environment. They weren't accustomed to the researcher. They didn't know this researcher. They had no reason to trust this researcher. And so when the promise was made, they did know the marshmallow looked pretty good, and they don't know this researcher, so oh, they took the marshmallow. You know, when I want something, I want it now. Does anybody else feel that way? I mean, who has their Christmas list already, like, laminated and, and triplicate handed out to your family members, right? When we, when we want something, we, we want it now. And for me, when I want something, I want it now. I'm a little obsessive about it. I'll research, I'll, I'll read, and I'll just go buy it. Ask my wife. It's really frustrating for her to try to buy me something because if I want it, I'll just I'll research it and I'll go, I'll go get it. And so even if it's something good or virtuous that I want, I want it now. You know, when I believe that God is doing something um, or that he's going to deliver in some way, I still want it to be the way that I see fit because I'm, I'm the one who knows what, what it should be like, right? You know, in newsflash, God's timing is not our timing almost ever. You know, if you've been around Restore for a while, you know about God's timing. Um, you know, how many times did we as a church believe that we would be leaving this building? Um, you know, how many times did it not work out? How many times were we discouraged when something didn't work out? You know, the way that we planned it in our heads. What I want us to remember, one of, the, one of the first points here is that God knows exactly what we need, exactly when we need it. The people wanted their thirst quenched now in the desert. Moses brought them to the next logical conclusion. The, maybe this is the first place they found. You know, maybe, and it doesn't say this in the text, but I wonder, maybe Moses knew of this spring. Maybe he said, okay, you know what, I know there's a spring nearby, let's go to that. I'll get you guys what you need right now as you need it. You know, it doesn't say that, but maybe, I don't know. But the water wasn't fit to drink. But instead of trusting that, okay, there must be something better down the road, they grumbled and complained and cried out to God. And, you know, God said, okay, fine, I'll give you what you want right now. Fine, here you go. Throw this log in there, make it fit to drink, and there you go. And now, I like the way the NIV words this, because in this passage, um, before verse 26, it says, there the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do it right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought to the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Now, what's interesting about that, that section there is that when studying ancient Hebrew text, whenever you see a sentence begin with, he said, this indicates a new thought or conversation. So the ruling and instruction, or as the ESV puts it, the statute or rule, it's not the if you listen carefully part. So what was the statute? What was this instruction they were given? Jewish scholars believe that the ruling was that the lame, the sick, the elderly, and marginalized were to go and drink from the spring first before everybody else. So if you think about this, you have a lot of people, and they're all real thirsty, and you come to this spring that has now been made fit to drink, but we have to let all the marginalized groups, the elderly, the sick, come and drink first. Think how long that must have taken. Think how long you had to sit there, still thirsty, still hot and sweaty, waiting for the water to be your turn. You can come and drink it. So what's interesting is if you move on the passage, uh, the, to verse 27, they came to this place called Elim. And what did they find at Elam? They find 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped out near the water. They, they, like, turn a corner. They just keep going a little further, and they have a spot with 12 springs and 70 palm trees. Is there anything that stands out to you there? 12. There was 12. There was one spring for every tribe of Israel. And, and 70 palm trees, a shaded spot in the desert. Like, what? <laughs> if, if only they had just trusted and just kept going, and just waited. They'd have been like, oh man, what a better experience. But they wanted what they wanted, when they wanted it, and they grumbled and they cried out, and God said, okay, all right, I'll give you what you want. It's fit to drink, but let these folks drink first. Fast forward a little ways, had you just waited, 
you would have had a much easier time, a much better place with all these palm trees and shade. If you just wait to buy that iPad Pro, you could probably get the old one for a cheaper price or get better features, right? How hard is it to do that, though? You just got to wait. If they waited on the Lord, they would find that he is faithful to give us what we need exactly when we need it. You know, not that long ago, you know, we thought we were going to merge with a nearby church. That didn't happen. I was discouraged at the time. I wondered if we would ever get out of this place. Could God have given us what we wanted and forced it if we cried out and we just tried to make it work? Maybe. God can do anything. But we were patient. We said, okay, that wasn't it. We're just going to keep going, keep being faithful. And I don't know. I think maybe this new arrangement could be like our 70 palm trees and 12 springs. I don't want to be too optimistic, but I mean, I'd like to think that. That's an encouraging thing. You just got to wait. You just got to keep going. Keep, keep pressing on. How often are we the kids in the marshmallow experiment that eat the first marshmallow as soon as we see it? As soon as that researcher is gone, we eat that marshmallow. God wants us to trust him. He has shown us over and over again that he keeps his promises. He's given us all the data to back up who he says he is. So many times I think that we can feel like those Israelites just wandering through a dry land. And God may feel like he's far away. But what the people learned that day at Mara and what we learn reading this passage is that God's timing does not match our expectations all the time. And we often want to be God and take control of the situation and force it, right? I mean, I've done it many times, and every single time I learn my lesson, but it's the hard way. Really hard sometimes. God knows exactly what we need exactly when we need it. If we can only be still and wait on the Lord, we'll see that he will provide what we need. He will bring healing. He'll deliver us. As we enter um, into the Advent season coming up, you know, we have to remember that God promised us a Savior, and he delivered on that promise. Jesus was born to fulfill God's plan of redemption. Trust in God's promises. Just be patient. Just wait. You may find that the longer you have to wait for something, the sweeter your fulfillment will be in the end. Maybe right now you're waiting for something. Maybe you're in that dry period where you feel like God's not around. He's not hearing what you're saying. But I encourage you just to stay in prayer. Ask that your will will line up with God's will. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you the patience and the trust that you need to be able to endure the desert that you find yourself in. Lean on your community. That's why we're here. Pray with somebody. But know this. Know that God is a God of faithfulness, and he's a God who will always keep his promises. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we need help sometimes. We get impatient. We want to do things our way. We try to force things. I just ask that you help us to, to remember this story and remember that if we just wait on you, you will bring us to a much better scenario than we could ever control on our own. Be with us through this season. Help us to remember why it is we celebrate. Help us to be thankful for the ways that you've brought us through the Red Sea, that you've brought us through trials, and that you uh, make us victorious. And just um, be with us this day. Be with us as we continue to worship you. And um, we love you, Father. And we pray. Amen.